Thessaloniki is the second largest city in Greece. It's both ancient and modern, as much of that country is. In between, it was a jewel in the Ottoman Empire and a multicultural beacon in the pre-World War I era. And that is the Thessaloniki that its current mayor has been working to reconnect with since he took the oath of office in 2011 at some very real personal cost to himself. He is Yanis Boutaris, and he joins us now for more. Kiryani Boutaris, it is so good to meet you, and thank you for making some time for us at TVO tonight. Thank you, Steve. I don't want to assume that everybody knows where your city is, so we're going to bring up a map yeah. here just so we can let everybody know. <laughs> everybody knows Athens. They may not know. There's the capital city, Athens. They may not know Thessaloniki, but there it is in northern Greece. And it is a very, very, very old city, founded in 315 B.C. It is, of course, the second largest city in Greece. It has a population a little over a million people. It is the capital of the northern province of Macedonia, and people may also know it by another name, Salonika, as it is also known. I want to start, and as we talk, I'm going to ask our director to bring up some pictures of you, because there was a very dramatic episode that happened to you earlier this year. In May, you returned to your job after having had heart surgery. You planned to attend an annual event, the commemoration of the genocide of the Pontic Greeks yes. in the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Go ahead, Sheldon, let's show these pictures. What happened as you arrived? Well, uh, there yeah. was a, a, a kind of unrest on certain spots. It was, uh, the gathering was more than 2,000 people. But in, in certain spots, there were certain arrests uh, uh, shouting at me, leave, you don't, haven't got any place here, and things like that. And uh, little by little, they started gathering around me. And uh, then it became a little dangerous. I didn't respond to any of the curses uh, that I got. And then my two bodyguards, they tried to push me out of the crowd and lead me to the car so that we could leave. And then it happened. They, uh, they kicked me, they beat me, they threw me down, and uh, they even destroyed the car. But. Uh, that was it. How old are you, may I ask? Uh, I was born in 1942, so I'm 76 already. You were 76. They yeah. beat up a 76-year-old man. We saw you got shoved to the ground, and yeah. they had to whisk you out of there. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it happens. When you have uh, uh, fanatic crowds, and uh, I, the police found that. I didn't know it. The, the, these people, that uh, 16 people were arrested. And these 16 people all are of uh, extreme right ideology. I wouldn't dare say they're from Golden Dawn, which is the party of the extreme right. We should just put this up, because the, the Golden Dawn has gained a great deal of attention. Yeah. Not necessarily so many seats. I think they've only had between, say, 17 and 21 seats in the 300-seat parliament. Yeah. parliament, so not that many seats. But They, Sheldon, have, they uh, have two seats in, in our municipality. And one of the reasons they hate me is that uh, when in... Uh, 2014, I won the election again, and uh, during the oath we gave, I, in, in protesting the presence of the Golden Dawn, which are Nazis. Well, you, you say they're Nazis. Take a look at their logo. Go ahead, Sheldon, bring it up. I put, I mean, that, I put the gold, yeah, yeah. That looks a bit like a swastika, you yeah. have to admit, yeah. you know. But uh, there it is. I, I, I had the Yellow Star of David for me, so that I could uh, declare my protest against this. Ideology. And there you are wearing yeah. that star. Yeah. yeah. As Jews had to wear during the World War II years. Yeah. Hmm. All right. We're, I should have asked, uh, were you hurt during the attack? Well, I, I, I had some uh, problems, uh, some headaches, but I was not really hurt. You seem in good shape today, I'm glad to say. I am, yes, I am. Good. I am. Let me read this. This is an excerpt from the New Republic, and we'll set up the next part of our conversation. In the last year, though, a startling resurgence of xenophobic violence has again worried observers. From 2016 to 17, the number of hate crimes documented by the Hellenic police more than doubled, growing from 84 to 184 incidents. In early 2018, the violence showed little signs of letting up. Fueled by frustration over the refugee crisis, anger over the Macedonian name talks, simmering tensions with Turkey, and discontent with the left-wing-led government Protests were staged in several cities, and xenophobic violence regularly made headlines. Pakistani migrant workers were attacked in their homes and in fields. 
Refugees were pelted with bottles and stones on Greek islands, and nonprofit organizations working with refugees received a spate of death threats. Jewish memorials and cemeteries were desecrated several times in Thessaloniki. I want to know more about this Golden Dawn and how much of a threat you think they truly are to civilized life in Greece. Well, look, uh, Golden Dawn is uh, part of life, I would say. You see, uh, far right and the Nazi uh, movements all over Europe, and not only Europe, you see, even in the States. So uh, I think that we'll live with it. The thing is how it, this can be kept on a low level. So uh, it's uh, the, the, the growth of the, of, the, of the Golden Dawn activities. I think uh, its reason is that uh, the crisis. In Greece, we have an economic crisis, not only in Greece, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we cannot understand what happens. Why the crisis? Why we lost 25% uh, of our income, uh, the gross national income? Uh, why, why all these things is happening? Why is this crisis? And so on. When you cannot explain something, uh, you get angry. And when you get angry, you are easily led by easy, easy solutions that he is to blame, the refugees are to blame, the Pakistanis are to blame, the Jews are to blame. Uh, they cannot, they, they, they try to persuade the everyday, everyday person that uh, it's not their fault, it's not the government's fault, it's something, somebody else. Once it was the Americans, the other time it was the Germans, now it's the, the, the Jews or the, 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 the refugees. You've got to find a villain somewhere. Yeah. Let me ask you, one of the other things referenced in that New Republic piece was the negotiations that have been going on between the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, as it, was, as it has been known, a rather cumbersome name, but there it is, and Greece. Both sets of negotiators mm -hmm. eventually satisfied themselves on a compromise name yep. for this former Yugoslav Republic. They've decided to call it Northern Macedonia. Yep. Uh, obviously, lots of unhappiness on both sides. Yep. Uh, I'd be interested in what your view is on that compromise. Look, so the problem is not new. The problem is more than 200 years old. And uh, the thing is that uh, uh, when, uh, after the, the falling apart of the, of the uh, East Bloc, let's say, and uh, after the falling apart of Yugoslavia, which was separated in many different states, and uh, the, the, the democracy of Macedonia, which was part of Yugoslavia, was uh, uh, agreed to be called the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia until we found the solution for the name. Mm -hmm. Now, we couldn't find the solution for more than 25 years since, 90, since the 90s. And, uh, most of the countries all over the world recognize it as the Republic of Macedonia. We didn't agree, and uh, they saw they couldn't enter NATO, and they couldn't enter the European Union, because you need unanimous decisions on the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, although it hurts, that uh, when you come to an agreement, and you have discussions, and you have negotiations, you come to an agreement, you lose something, and you win something. Now, I think that, uh, it's, I don't know any other case in the world history that a, a, a state who is willing to change the name, uh, calling the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia, calling it Northern Macedonia, uh, without war. Without, without war. war. Yeah. But Greeks don't like Macedonians using the word Macedonia in the name of their country. How come? Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a misunderstanding because uh, uh, Macedonia is a, a, a huge territory, and after World War I, it was divided in three pieces. One of it went down to Greece, 50% went to Greece, 30% went to uh, northern Macedonia, and another 15% went to Bulgaria. So, for, I, I come from this area, and uh, I don't really mind very much. I heard. And I heard mainly because they said that they are straight, uh, they come down from Alexander the Great, which is totally wrong, it's foolish. Because the Slavs, they are Slavs, all of them, they came to the area uh, 600, after, 600 years after Christ. Well, Alexander the Great was 300 years before Christ. Before Christ, so yes. It's, it's not possible. 
But uh, it's a simply a sentimental thing. I think that eventually, uh, because we are very good friends. In an everyday life, we're very good friends. They come to Saloniki, we go to Skopje. Uh, it's normal. And I think that uh, whenever you, f you make a, a, a negotiation, when you try to make an agreement, you have to give something also. Mm -hmm. And you don't have only to take. So that's the case. I want, uh, Sheldon, if you would, to put up, uh, let's go pictures four, five, six, and seven. We, uh, here's you. Here's you uh, participating in the, uh, the Gay Pride, yeah. Yeah. Gay Pride event, yeah. yes. Um, earlier this year, the Holocaust Memorial at Aristotle University was vandalized. Politicians seem to use, openly use, anti-Semitic epithets against you. Um, you have also made past comments on the Turks, uh, which has, uh, I guess, been seen by many as to have fueled the anger behind the attack in May, the attack we talked about off the top. You have said the Turks are our brothers. And I'm quoting you here, I don't give a shit if Ataturk killed Greeks. What's my question? My question is, are, do you go looking for trouble, I guess is the question. No, I'm just, uh, sometimes I'm, uh, I cannot close my mouth. <laughs> the thing is that, the thing is that, uh, when uh, we took over the municipality, I said that uh, you cannot build your future. I said to my co-citizens, you cannot build, build your future unless you know your past. Mm -hmm. That is the past of the city. More than 2,500 years of history. Greek, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine, Ottoman, and at the same time, uh, Saloniki, as you probably know, if you don't know it, I'll tell you that. Saloniki is known as the mother of refugees. The first big wave of refugees came from Spain, the, 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 the Jews from Spain, the Sephardic Jews Actually, from Spain. Let me pick up on that. By your your worship, stand by. Yeah. I got something I want to read here which will which will help put that into perspective, mm -hmm. put some background. Sheldon, board three, please, if you would. They call this place the city of ghosts. For centuries, it was a major trading port, second only to Constantinople in the Byzantine Empire. Then in 1430, the Ottomans came, bringing with them Islam and its minarets. Sixty years later, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain ordered Jews who did not convert to Christianity to get out of their country. Around 20,000 came to Thessaloniki, welcomed by the Ottomans, who had seen them thrive in Spain and believed they had something to offer. They were right. For almost 500 years, Jewish life flourished in the city, which sprouted almost 30 synagogues, sitting peaceably alongside its mosques and churches. The Jews even became a majority of the population until Greece reclaimed the city in 1912, driving out the Muslims and resettling Greeks there in great numbers. Layers of history sit like sediment on Thessaloniki. I want to know whether you think the people of Thessaloniki today understand that they once had a very multicultural history a century and more ago. Well, uh, I think that they started understanding it. And I'll tell you why. When I said that, I meant that we have to bring up the history of Thessaloniki. Because the history of Thessaloniki, and don't forget that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the, the creator of the Turkish uh, democracy was born in Saloniki, his house in Saloniki, and is now used as a museum for Saloniki. And uh, when uh, uh, we said that, uh, we brought it up because everything, uh, uh, the behavior of the people of Saloniki towards the Jews was, was hidden. Nobody spoke about it. This is why Mazao says the city of God. So, uh, and uh, the, the, the against the Turks, the feelings against the Turks, which are bad. And why I say that uh, I feel a brother with the Turks? Because we lived for 500 years together. We had uh, very many uh, same customs, the same food, uh, same, same behaviors. They are Muslims, we are, we are Christians. But that was then. This that is was, now, and there is a yeah. lot more angst about Turks, about Syrians, about refugees, yeah. about yeah. everything nowadays. You are right. but. The thing is that a common person doesn't care about politics. So when we go to Istanbul or to Smyrna or to uh, Pondos, we go to the, to the houses of our ancestors, of our fathers, of our grandfathers and things like that. The same thing feel the Turks when they come to Saloniki and visit 
either the, the house of Kemal Ataturk or the houses in Saloniki. They come to the municipality and they ask for maps and try to find the house of the grandparents. So when they took over, there were not more than 5,000 Turks arriving in Saloniki. Now there are more than 100,000 visiting only the museum of Kemal Ataturk. 100,000 Turks visiting more. that museum yeah. every year? Every year, for the last years. And the same thing happens with the Israelis. They come from all over, either from Israel. Or we have two flights per day from Istanbul. We have one regular flight from Tel Aviv. And the Jews, they come from Israel, or they come from Paris, or they come from the United States, all of them. They want to find out what this is, I think, was. So we decided to build a museum of Holocaust in Saloniki. There is a planned Holocaust museum yeah. of Greece, planned for Thessaloniki. Yeah. I think we have it. There it is right there. That's, a, I yeah. guess, an artist's yeah, rendering there. of it yeah. right there. When now, do you think that, do, are, you're hopeful start, that'll be finished? It will start being built the uh, first three, four months of uh, next year. Now, the thing is that it's not going to be just a museum of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a museum and an educational center for the city of Saloniki. So that we'll see why Saloniki was called the Jerusalem of Balkans. Why Saloniki was called Mother of Israel. Why Saloniki was flourishing with the presence of the Jewish community. Uh, it, it, so we, we will try through this museum to give to, the, to our co-citizens who don't know the, hi the history, which was hidden. We try to give them the feeling to be proud that no. Saloniki was multinational and multicultural. It cannot be, again, the same thing, but we can have lessons from this thing. Do you fear that by building this museum in Thessaloniki that you will inflame the passions of the hard right and make reconciliation more difficult? No, I feel that uh, we can manage it and we can make the people of Saloniki love their city because their city is multicultural and multinational. Uh, the, the same way it was. It had uh, 35, more than 35 synagogues. All of them were destroyed. It had, I don't know how many uh, mosques and minarets. All of them were destroyed. It has only churches now. So. Uh, uh, nowadays, when you have all these floods of, of uh, refugees coming either from Syria or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Afghanistan, they are coming <coughs> and they want to find a place to live in peace. Right. I should ask you about your own political future. You are only <laughs> 76. <laughs> Do you plan to run for re-election next spring? Uh, I'm not very sure yet. I'll decide uh, around Christmas. That's interesting. That's not a no. Most people at 76 have had their fill of public life. Well, uh, I had my share, yes, uh, this is true, I had my share. But um, uh, the, the, this, this party that we have organized it, and we won two elections, and it's uh, an independent party. I don't love parties, uh, the political parties. I don't belong to anything. I have an ideology, I'm a social democrat, but I don't belong to any party. I'm independent. You're very independent, as I can tell, because, Mr. Mayor, I have to tell you, I don't know any 76-year-olds who have an earring. Oh. And you have an earring. What's the story behind that? Uh, when my granddaughter was born, <laughs> I belonged to a tribe. I'm from a tribe in Greece. We have Lachs, Vlachi. They, they live uh, in northwestern uh, Macedonia, up on the mountains. And most of them are uh, immigrants all over the world. So they have this, this custom that uh, they... they, they my father wore a earring until he was 16. So I wore this earring for the bad eye. When my granddaughter was born, which I'm in love with her. She's 22 now, she's just graduated from NYU, the T School hmm. of Theater. And uh, when she was born, my wife was called, uh, late wife was called Athena, she got her name. And I put this earring for the bad eye. How old were you when you put the earring in? Uh, 22 years ago. 22 years ago, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay, that's an interesting story. It's very sentimental. Yes, I can very see. Sentimental. Good. Yeah. Uh, I do want to, I mean, I, I, I hate to end this on a negative note, but I do want to know whether you think the people of Greece are open to uh, a more, are open to a political future that is less extreme, less at the margins, and more coming together around some shared values in the middle. What do you think? Uh, I'm not very optimistic, uh, Steve, and I'll tell you why. Uh, through this uh, crisis that covers all Europe, uh, Portugal, uh, Cyprus, Ireland went through the crisis too. Uh, with Greece too, but 
all these other countries, they, all the parties, they sat on the table and they agreed on certain things. In Greece, instead of sitting on a table to agree on certain things that have to be done, either it will be changes in the government or changes in the taxation system, education system, or whatever, they didn't sit on the table. Even the, the, the Macedonian problem, they didn't sit on the table to see how it will be solved. Mm. It was just the decision of the government. Now, this, uh, this behavior of the parties uh, doesn't give me a hope that things will become better. If the economic prospects of Greece as a whole were to improve, do you think that would reduce the amount of uh, distrust and sometimes hatred of strangers, of the other? Uh, definitely. The money is a way of solving problems, but it's not the only way. Uh, the only way to solve these kind of problems is through education, saying the truth to the people, and not just beautifying things. Money beautifies things. You don't have money, you are angry, you get frustrated and things. You have money, you can buy new clothes, you can go for a trip, and it makes you feel that it's, it's, everything is good, which is not. How much do you blame, for example, the International Monetary Fund for sticking to I don't blame what, in the view of many Greeks, would be too hard a line when it came to Greece making its repayments. Uh, I, think, I think that if, if uh, we, we did what we agreed to do on the first memorandum of uh, the International Monetary Fund, things would be much, much better. We didn't do what we ought to do. Mm. I think part of what you're about, though, is trying to get other people to open up their hearts a little bit to people who are not like them. Can that happen in today's Greece? <laughs> uh, look, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, the Bishop of Saloniki is a very, very conservative person. He's honest, he's straight, but he's far right. Mm. So uh, in 2010, during the election, uh, I said that the Bishop reminds me of Mujahideen. And uh, when I went to the ch to church on the 26th of October, he said to me like that, you call me Mujahid, you'll never see the uh, Megos chair. That's in front of the, in the church, inside the church. Now, I think that this gave me the 300 votes margin that I won the election at the time. Hmm. Because even the far right people didn't agree that the priest, a priest, the church, would decide who would be the mayor of the city. So after I won, I went to him and I said, look, you want it or not, I don't suggest it to become friends, but you want it or not, you are a religious head of the city and I'm the political head. We have to give an example of solving problems. Mm -hmm. And it is to his, I, I praise him for that. Since then, since 2011, we cooperate very well together. But uh, the thing is that uh, well, this is the example. Uh, in 2012, we had the, the gay pride and the gay pride, and he was furious and things like that, and he called me. And I said, what, what is your problem? These are people, they are different. Uh, nobody can manage it. They have the right to express their own feelings once a year in, in, in public so that they can say that we are different. So what is your problem? And after discussing for a lot of time, uh, he said, okay, but don't pass me in front of the church. And, uh, Were you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so nice compromise. The problem was solved. It was a good compromise for him and for me. Hmm. So we have in 2020, we won the, the, the European uh, Gay Pride uh, event. It's uh, more, more than 15 days. It will happen in Saloniki, and we won it. And I think that we won it because we show to everybody that we are extroverts, that we accept differences, we not only accept, we, we like differences. Hmm. And I say to everybody, look at it, uh, your fingers, are all of them are the same? No. So you must accept the difference. Uh, it's, it's absolutely normal. Uh, uh, you know, with that kind of charisma, I now understand how you became the mayor of the Saloniki. You're a pretty good politician. <laughs> look, I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm not a politician. But uh, I, 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 I think I have uh, a common logic. Hmm. And I say that, I say the truth. 
also it, it hurts. I say the truth about all the big problems that I face. I say to the people working in Saloniki, the people in the garbage collection system, they work four hours per day, five hours per day. I said, look, you are paid for eight hours per day. Let's make an agreement. Either you work eight hours a day, or I make contact with privates. Did, it was a, a did huge, that change things? It changed. It, it changed. They work, and they, they are paid well, and uh, they are doing a good work too. Because you say to them, look, you are here for life. I cannot fire you. <laughs> but uh, most probably I cannot fire you, fire you, but I'll put somebody else in your place. And you'll be paid only just a salary per day and not the overdues that, mm. that you have. So what do you prefer? <laughs> Sometimes you've got to blackmail people, too. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Uh, Mayor Butaris, it's really good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Um, there are, of course, numerous links between Greece and Canada, including, I can remember, hmm, it's got to be 40, 45 years ago, your former Prime Minister, Papandreou, yeah. who was a professor at York University for a time. Yeah. So uh, we're grateful that you've continued this tradition of Greek politicians mm -hmm. visiting Canada, and we look forward to your decision on whether you will seek re-election next year. Yeah. Thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, just one small detail. My grandson, he is at, uh, a student uh, since uh, September, since the beginning of September at McGill University. In Montreal. And, uh, oh. uh, in Montreal. And Wonderful. I'm very proud of it. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Another link between Greece and Canada. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.